Hey guys, hello everyone. Let me uh, share my screen with you here. Tell me if you can see this. Great, so I'm excited about this. I'm really excited about this set. So I don't want you to think that I only use the XS. I, I really like all of the features of this, of this uh, expert set. Even a couple weeks ago, I used the uh, dorsal plates. Um, so it just depends on the fracture, but this is probably one of my favorite plates that I'll talk to you about. So just disclosures, I am a consultant. Um, so there's a difference between MIS and small incision. I think it's important to kind of highlight this. So minimally invasive uh, usually refers to small incision and keeping the pronator quadratus intact. Um, I think it's hard, I would argue, to keep the pronator quadratus intact with the small incision. I know that's, that's possible, but I am basically describing my case series of small incisions. So tw two centimeters or less, I do incise through the pronator quadratus, and then I repair the muscle at the end of the surgery. But there is, as was mentioned previously, there is this uh, pronator quadratus uh, sparing guide. So this guide, uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor, actually fits over the pronator quadratus and then you screw, put your screw holes uh, through the pronator quadratus. I, um, I think it's difficult to do that um, with a really small incision. And if you look at even the example they use is a pretty big incision here on the bottom right. So, um, but that is, there is a pronator quadratus uh, sparing guide available also. So why minimally invasive? So the disadvantage you'd argue, it's uh, less visualization, so a higher risk of poor fixation and poor reduction, and arguably a higher risk of iatrogenic injury. But if you do it right, it's pretty low, and I'll show you a video of me doing one. The advantages, less soft tissue stripping, but again, this is arguable, right? So it depends on whether or not you keep the pronator quadratus intact. I incise through it, but I think the best advantage is a better scar and I'll, I'll explain and I'll show you why I think that's actually a great advantage. So why did I go this route? So I was trained a traditional way. I went to Dartmouth for my residency, Columbia in New York for my fellowship and we did a standard incision. It's about four to six centimeters in size. I think four is probably pretty average. Um, but then I moved to Park City, Utah. It's where I'm currently practicing. Many patients, they're concerned about cosmetic nature of things. We, we do have a very busy plastic surgeon in town and especially women are very concerned about the nature and how things look. Um, there's also a, a perception, this could be correct or incorrect among people, that with smaller incisions means a better surgeon and better outcomes. I, again, I think that's arguable, but there is a perception that's uh, commonly held among many people, um, including my patients. This is what I think is the main reason I did this. There's this art of surgery, and that's what I think is so fun about surgery, is that there's this art component to it. And I think that's why I love it. There's something about doing a really small incision that patients love and having a great outcome. So here's, here's like, this actually sums up my talk. Um, so this is a post-operative picture of a scar that I did on a, on a patient. She was a 58 year old, super healthy personal trainer, uh, as active and healthy as you can imagine. And this is after I fixed her distal radius. So she had a fall, I think it was mountain biking. And um, that's her incision. So where is the incision? So I used, so she has a tattoo lift. And if you can see my cursor, can you guys see my cursor okay? So my incision is right here through the T. We so can see just, it, yes. So it's right here. And this is six weeks post-op of fixing her distal radius. And, I, and for me, that's what's so fun about this. And, and new clip is, is allowed for a plate to make this very, very doable. And I think that's why I'm such a proponent of this, this small plate. So um, there is a history of this. So there is, there is data to support these small incisions. So let me know, uh, Julian can correct my pronunciation of, he's a French surgeon and, and, and uh, he's done over 2000 cases with one and a half centimeter incisions. Um, there's, there's another group in the European Journal of Traumatology who did additional several surgeries, one and a half incision. A group uh, down at Columbia, they have 39 patients with small incision. And the biggest argument is at the bottom, cosmetic satisfaction was present in 97% of patients. As patients just, just like how it looks. And I have several patients that will compare their scars to others that had uh, surgery done by other surgeons. And, uh, and I, I think, I know that patients love it. So here's the plate, here's the plate that I love. So this is the XS, I call it the micro plate. 
Um, XS stands for extra small. Um, and it is, from my understanding, it's the, it's the smallest plate available on the market. I, I can't confirm that though. And I don't know if Chris or someone else can, but I believe it's the smallest plate. Um, so here's kind of the, the lateral profile. And you can see that this is key. So you've got this kickstand screw proximally that can really get that proximal fixation. You can see kind of on this, if you look at this plane, that they're, they're a little divergent, so allowing for better fixation. And that also makes it easier. With the smaller incision, you can get that kickstand screw um, really easily. So I've done now 72 patients. So as of this date, I've done 72 patients with a centimeter, two centimeters or less. Um, so 65, about 65 of them were with the microplate. So I actually did several of them trying to go really, really small with the, the standard new clip step one plate. And it was the first generation step one. So it's not the current one. They had just a one distal row that I could squeeze in a, a plate with that. But the far majority have been with this microplate. I have had two complications. One was loss of reduction. And this is where I tried to push the envelope a little bit and using this plate. So it was a Bowler Barton shear fracture. I've actually gotten away with a few of those, but that was a mistake. I shouldn't have done it because you don't have a lot of buttress, as enough buttress effect uh, with that type of fracture. So be careful with a small plate like this with a fracture like that. And you guys are probably all thinking, well, duh. Um, but yeah, I, I did push it a little bit. And then I had one patient had a wound dehiscence, but he was also camping. That was kind of ridiculous. One other patient had an EPL rupture six months post-op, but I don't think it has anything to do with the plate or the technique, but she did have an EPL rupture. No formal study yet, hoping to get this together. I'm still collecting patients. I'm hoping to get to around 100 before I think we publish this. For all patients, all are very satisfied, especially with the cosmetic look of their wrist. So indications, contraindications. So indications, these are dorsally angulated, extra-articular. You can do some simple intra-articular radius fractures, but, uh, but that's the standard at the metaphyseal daphyseal junction. So contraindication, so if it's really osteopenic bone, so be careful of the elderly woman. Um, um, more severe dysrhesis fractures, anything with proximal extension, obviously that's not gonna work. And then the volarly, volarly displaced fractures. So the Smith, the Volar Barton, those ones be really careful because you're not gonna have enough of a buttress effect with that plate. So be careful of those ones. But if you think about just this top indications, the dorsi angulated, extra-articular and simple intra-articular, those are the far majority fractures. So I think this, can, this plate can be used in the far majority of distal radius fractures. So now I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about my technique. So, so the key with this technique and what you can discuss with, uh, with surgeons is just the starting point. So this is really the key. So you have to be careful you start it. So um, this patient's a little swollen. I'll show you on my video, you can see it a little bit better. So we have the distal wrist crease and then you have the proximal wrist crease um, and then you want to go one centimeter proximal to the most proximal wrist crease. So, you, you, so your starting incision is going to seem quite proximal, but it's going to land you right on top of the fracture. Then you go two centimeters beyond that. And that's, that's, that's the key is the starting point. Beyond that, it's pretty straightforward like you normally would. So you release the FCR tendon sheath as, pro, as far proximal as you can see, as far as distal as you can see. You retract the FCR ulnarly, you incise through the sheath, and as far proximal and distal, you retract the FPL ulnarly, incise through the pronated quadratus if you decide to do that. Um, but the MIS guide, as I mentioned before, allows to try to keep that pronated quadratus intact. And then you fix the fractures you normally would. To get proximal fixation, in order to be able to, to really see, sometimes it helps to flex up the wrist. So when you flex up the wrist, then it kind of opens up that incision um, even more. So I'll give you a couple examples and I'll show you a video. So 69 year old gentleman had a fall. You can see he has a dorsally, a little bit dorsally angulated distal radius fracture. This is post-op, how it looks. Here's a, a woman, a 63 year old woman. She had an intra-articular distal radius fracture. You can see this piece right in here. Um, so this is her post-op. And you can see also that I, for the most part, I just do two proximal screws. I think there's a little bit of a, a feeling that you have to go with three proximal screws, you, you really don't. And, I, and I, I, that's what one thing that I'd love to kind of show in this study is that two solid proximal screws is really all you need for the far majority of these fractures. 
what's nice of this oblong hole is that it is have a locking tech guide or a locking ability. So you can put a third screw in, but sometimes it's right at the fracture and so you can't. So here's some post-op incisions. Um, so one and a half, I try to keep it about one and a half to two centimeters or, or less. Um, here's a 51 year old woman. She was a mountain biker. She's uh, she was a physical therapist from Phil from Pennsylvania. Um, I still get thank you cards from her um, at, for, because of her scar. So here's her post op. Here is after I fixed it. Here's a 25 year old woman. She's on the U.S. ski team. So here is her post reduction films. You can still see that she still has some dorsal um, translation of the fracture. So here's her post-op incision. So one and a half centimeter. This is a woman, I just saw her this week. So this is her post-op scar, three months post-op. And she was bragging and showing this off to all of her friends who also had uh, scars that were two to three times the size. So now I wanna give you a case presentation, just actually just show you the video on how to do this. So this is a 26 year old woman, she was healthy. They tried to reduce this several times. You can still see that she's dorsally angulated, dorsally translated. This is like, when you see this type of fracture, this is the, this is the perfect fracture for this, like perfect. You just, you ought to be super excited when you see this. And that's what you can do this, this small plate. So let's show how to do this. So it's, it's pretty straightforward, as I had mentioned, um, but the key with this is your starting point. So here's the most proximal wrist crease. You can see there's the distal wrist crease and the proximal wrist crease. And then you go one centimeter proximal to that proximal wrist crease. And then you just measure two centimeters. You can go a centimeter and a half, um, whatever you want. So, but that, that is really kind of be the key to do this uh, through a small incision. And if you look at it, you're like, gosh, that actually looks pretty big. But you'll see as we kind of go forward that it's, it's fairly small. So we're gonna try to speed it up just a little bit, just to save a little time so you guys don't get bored. So as we identify the FCR tendon, so there it is. So again, you try to retract and release as far as you can, proximally and distally, so you can see just as, as much as possible, just as far as you can see. Don't cut what you can't see. We know that rule. I incise through the peroneal quadratus. So here's the plate. So it comes in a left and a right. So and then they have a two a K wire holes. So I like to do a lift off technique. You know, however you want to do it is fine. So I get fixation distally first, and then get that kickstand screw after that so so you can see it, it, it is you do have to work in a little bit of a tight space so this is this is the uh, variable angle guide you can see that basically fills up the entire incision um, that's a variable angle guide for distally if you need to use this there there is the uh, the standard fixed angle guide which is a, a lot smaller that you can use but if you have to get the plate just a little bit distal, then you should probably use the variable angle. So here's intra-op pictures. So you can see I've got distal fixation. It's off the bone proximally. So now I can do the liftoff technique to bring it down to the bone and, and, and recreate that, um, that volar tilt of the distal radius. So here's the kickstand screw. So I like to do the kickstand screw first when I'm going proximal. Um, that really kind of locks it in. If you do the other screw first and then you do a kickstand screw, it will, you'll probably have to change out that other screw because it'll get a little loose as you get fixation proximally. So now we've, we've got the fixation, we've done it. And then here's the pronated quadratus. And this is just showing repair of the pronated quadratus. So I know this is arguable for sure. I personally don't think there's a huge difference in keeping it intact, but I know Mark Ross, if he's on the phone, he's gonna start yelling at me because he, he, does, he thinks that it does make a difference. I, I think if you have a good repair of the peroneal quadratus, I really don't think it makes a big difference. So there's the incision. So it turns out about a centimeter and a half. I just used two steri strips. So two stereo strips. So here's her post reduction, post fixation films. There's the AP view. Here's the lateral view, just two screws. Her alignment is anatomic and, uh, and she has a very small scar. And I put them in a removable wrist brace is what I do. And 
you know, I know some folks, I spent a little time with the guys and some folks in France and they don't put them in any brace. Um, I still feel a little bit better putting them in a brace just to kind of restrict them a little bit because folks here in Park City are so active. So again, here's post uh, fixation. So a little bit of a summary. So less than two centimeter incisions for disarrayed fractures, they're a viable option with incredible patient satisfaction. Um, it's indicated as mentioned for dorsally angulated extraarticular and some simple intraarticular disradius fractures. And again, I'd argue that this is the majority of the fractures that we treat. It's contraindicated, osteopenic bone, more severe disradius fracture, the proximal extension, and any volarly displaced fracture. If you see any volar displacement, don't do it because you lose that buttress effect.